general elections 2019. We have reached the final day. Results are out. They're still coming in. It's precisely uh, 4.20. We've reached Harrow West and Harrow East. We've had some positive results and some really positive results. So I have here with me Bob Blackman and Dr. Anwar Ali. Uh, Bob has been the incumbent and has regained his position with a strong foothold. So before I go to Anwara, Bob, congratulations for winning back your seat. Thank you. Um, would you like me to give you the mic and go for it? Tell us how you made it. Well, I think we started off. Uh, you interviewed me some weeks ago uh, when the campaign started. Uh, you were very inquisitive about what I was going to do. And, and it's been very clear. We fought a strong election campaign on getting Brexit done, uh, ending the parliamentary blockade there's been to stop us leaving the European Union. So that's now over. Uh, we've got a, a solid majority in Parliament. We're waiting to see how big that is. But we're clearly going to have a working majority and a strong working majority to deliver that. But we also uh, weren't just concentrating on Brexit. We're talking about the public services, increasing the number of police, in increasing the number of doctors and nurses, improving the uh, level of housing across the country and improving education funding uh, across the country. So that's been important for us. We have had an election today which has been monsoon conditions. Yes. So if you're your viewers in India, if you think of voting during a monsoon, it's been like that for us over here. And, and more, more importantly, we're not used to it. Uh, yes, but how many people turned up? Tell me how Well, it, it, it's incredible because despite the dreadful weather, we had the same turnout as in 2017, which is remarkable. Um, I, I, I've never seen people going to the polling stations in such numbers during the day because the weather was awful and our volunteers we were going around trying to persuade people to go and vote. Uh, we're saying, oh, the weather's dreadful now. Maybe people won't vote. But actually, the turnout was strong throughout the day um, and, and throughout the evening. So we ended up with a, a, an excellent result. I'm, I've increased my majority from 1,757 to 8,200. Massive, massive increase. That's fabulous. And my personal vote has gone up from just over 25,000 to well over 26,000. So it's a it's a... Double whammy for what Labour. Double said. whammy for Labour. We've not only increased our votes, but we've reduced their vote considerably and got a stonking majority, which I'm delighted by. And the main reason for that is the British Indian vote that it resides in my constituency has been out very strongly voting for me. Uh, and as you know, I stand up very strongly for the British Indian community in Parliament, not only in Harrow East, but across the country, and I'm going to continue doing precisely that. That's fantastic to hear. The fact that um, the strong Indian majority came out to support uh, Bob Blackman and Anwar Ali is the, the sample of what we are saying. We are saying, look, if things happen the right way, we will support you. Now, I'm going to talk to Dr. Anwar Ali and get her uh, progress. Um, for her first time, she's done brilliantly well. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I had literally less than five, um, six weeks, and uh, I had, I think his majority was about 30,000. We've reduced it by 8,000, so we're literally knocking off sort of well over 1,000 votes per week. Um, and we had to share our time with, you know, both Bob and I had to also, uh, you know, be with the Prime Minister at times and help each other. Uh, so I think what it shows is how important the British Indian vote is. And what we've seen across the country is a sea change. And I would say that partly it's because of the resolution that Labour passed against British Indians, the anti-Hindi Hindu sentiment on top of their anti-Semitism. But also, if you look at the Indian diaspora in the United Kingdom, we stand for family. We stand for hard work. We believe that if you work hard, you get on in life. We, majority of us come from families who have SME businesses and bigger businesses, and we are all patriotic, and those are the very values of the Conservative Party. So I was always surprised why the Asian or the British Indian vote uh, would not come to the Conservatives. So I'm really glad that it has. And what we now need to do as a party is make sure that we deliver for the very people that voted for us so that they never leave us. And again, I welcome the huge majority that we're going to get across the country, which gives uh, strength to Boris Johnson, our prime minister, our excellent prime minister, uh, to go ahead 
and get Brexit done and take our country forward. Because I know what matters to everybody, regardless of colour, race, religion, is strong NHS, is uh, more, you know, strong schools, and uh, you know, uh, defeating the crime in our streets, making sure we've got more police officers, and we can really get up on with doing that now, delivering for our communities. And the other thing I want to say is that this time around, if you look at the Conservative Party's slate of candidates, the candidates actually ref reflected the demographics of this country. And what we want to see in future parliament, parliament should be 50% women, because 50% of the population are women. I don't tire of saying that. And also, it should reflect the diversity of our country, and it will do. So I have a question, though. Um, with what's happening, you know, the exit polls, and you're seeing what a landslide Labour is going to get, do yeah. you truly believe that, uh, okay, so obviously... Labour's going to get, Conservatives are going to get. <laughs> 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 you're just checking who's awake. <laughs> it's a landslip. <laughs> Thank you. The red, red curtain, right? yeah. We're decimating red it, red decimating red it, yeah. So now tell me something. Zach Goldsmith, uh, his results... Prime Minister Boris Johnson has come back, but what's, but what, what, what would be the actual reason why you think certain people have done well and certain not? I know that Wales has done really well for you, but why do you think Zach did? I think there's a, there's a there's a national factor there, but there's also a local factor. I think. So I think in Zach's seat, it was, uh, I think, 70% remain. And I think that's what that's why, you know, we lost that seat. But I will say that Zach is a fantastic MP and he's been a lifelong environmentalist and he's always put the environment right at the top of the agenda, which is so important to you and I and the young generation. So I hope that Zach will come back. I know that he will be part of our party and I'm sure in the future he'll come back and win that constituency because he has done that before, as you know. Um, I think you've done both really well. Uh, congratulations, and I'm sure you want to go back home and put your feet up. So, well done. Um, I'm just going to summarize by saying that um, Boris Johnson uh, is going to steam ahead, and with your support, I'm sure he'll do really well. Uh, we're going to cover your win and a lot more conservative wins uh, later on in our program. So, thank you again for being with us, and congratulations. Thank you. Namaskar, welcome. Welcome to a special episode of Rajniti. Aaj ka hamara Rajniti special, uh, Britain ke general election ko in depth uh, view karega. It's only our perspective. MATV has been following it for the last few months uh, really closely. We've been running Rajniti ever so often with the local MPs and people that make that important change to the country. They've been asking for Brexit and yes, we have got the Brexit deal through, not yet, but almost, uh, as Jeremy Corbyn uh, had tried very hard. He could not. Boris Johnson has won with a resounding majority. Uh, we've been talking to various MPs all night uh, through different polling stations. You've just seen um, a short clip from a recording of uh, interviews with Bob Blackman, who's again been voted back into power in Harrow East. Uh, so he's our MP again, and Anwar Ali, Dr. Anwar Ali, uh, who was uh, campaigning against uh, Gareth Thomas for Harrow West. Unfortunately, she did not make it, but for a first time, she did really, really well. I think there was only a 5,000 difference. Um, she did about 16 to 18,000 against the 22,000 that Gareth Thomas had. Obviously, the figures and facts still need to be confirmed. The final figures will come out later on. Newspapers are running the success story. With Rajniti, we have today with us Vijay Rana ji. Vijay Rana is a political expert. He has been talking to various members of the political team, and he's with us today. His background is very prolific. He's been uh, presenting on BBC, he's been doing radio, he's been doing RBC, and all sorts of political programs. We're very uh, blessed to have him here. He also has a magazine called Health and Happiness for You, which runs for the local community. Uh, I'd like to welcome you, sir. Welcome Thank you. Welcome to Rajneeti. Uh, you know Rajneeti really well. Yes, uh, I'm not an outsider. Yeah. <laughs> You're not. Yeah. Yeah. So we wanted to get some insider opinions. Um, as you've been obviously also following the elections, uh, the Conservative Party has won, and Boris Johnson has smashed the deadlock. He says today, uh, we did it. Biggest Conservative Party win since uh, Margaret Thatcher in 1987. Brexit 
as Mr. Johnson says, is irrefutable, unarguable decision now. No more referendums. So his 7 a.m. speech, what did you think? Oh, well, this is uh, a landmark decision. Uh, for last three and a half years, the country was standing on crossroads, not knowing which way to take. Now the country has decided, they have spoken, let the Brexit done. That was the slogan which uh, Boris Johnson uh, gave uh, to his uh, you know, fellow party men, and he has won a resounding victory. So uh, one thing is sure that we will have uh, the Brexit. How and how soon? The Prime Minister uh, Johnson is in a hurry. He wants to do it as soon as possible. But there are still some roadblocks that he will have to cross. So uh, yeah, this is the end of uncertainty. This is a decisive victory. Now, uh, there are lots of challenges before him. And let us see how he copes with it. Those initial speeches that he's talking about one nation tourism. Uh, but this is a divided country. Uh, the wounds are really, really deep. Uh, so his task is not easy. He will have to work as a healer. Uh, if he goes on kind of a right wing path, as, as a lot of people are worried about, have been worried about him, it will be difficult for him. But now his role should be as a victor who wants to heal the wounds that this country has suffered in the last three and a half years. Uh, we've been obviously following the speech. Uh, when I saw the speech this morning, I found that he was very humble. Uh, he was quite clear in his agenda. Uh, he was giving out the figures about the 50,000 nurses, 40 hospitals, and all of those details quite categorically and quite passionately. So I'm assuming that uh, he will deliver on his uh, democratic mandate and the NHS, immigration, policing and schools are going to be one of his top priorities. I'm not so sure how much he's keen on um, uh, the, the trade deal, uh, the trade deal with the European Union. We'll come to that. But what is your view on the NHS? Well, he's saying that, uh, you know, he will be, uh, first of all, there will be no cuts. He's clearly said that as far as America, Trump is concerned, the NHS is not on the table. Uh, so he is assuring that uh, there will be no trade deals regarding the HS or its internal market. Uh, they have said that they will. They started with they, they will, uh, you know, kind of establish 40 new hospitals, but now the figure has come down to approximately 20. Uh, so he is assuring the nation, and perhaps this was, you know, we see it as a Brexit election, but there were lurking issues. There were really, really serious issues investing in the social infrastructure of this country. Uh, there have been austerity for more than 10 years in this country. So the country is looking for lots of investment in education, in health. And this has been, again, a very strong uh, strand uh, for, for, for Boris Johnson, that he managed to convince that NHS is safe in the hands of Tories, which was a very difficult thing to do because Tories have, have a record of, of, of you know, austerity, cutting left, right, and center. So uh, I think uh, this is something, you know, besides Brexit, we should also not forget that he, he has managed to convince people that NHS is safe in his hands. And that's why this thumping majority has got. When I was following the uh, constituency where he's standing from, um, he talked about setting up hospitals and working on that. But unfortunately, he hasn't managed to uh, set up a new hospital in his own constituency. Uh, considering that, you know, he's not originally from there. Well, do you think that he is going to renege on his promises or do you think he's going to stick to uh, his promises that he's made during his campaigning times? Well, we will have to see in, in broad terms because uh, let's accept the reality. When any party goes into elections, they make promises which, which they can't keep up. Right. You know, this is, this is the... Uh, you can say a drawback of electoral politics that you have to make loud claims. We will do this. We'll do this. And let us see in real politics how much he can deliver. But uh, and and you know the the, uh, the people have a record because they will remember it. Look what has happened to Nick Clegg's Lib Dems. Uh, they joined Conservatives, and they they voted almost everything opposite to what they have promised. So uh, this is another end of Tory party. He will have to face elections in the next five years. He will have to deliver his program. Mm. He will have to, uh, to meet his promises and you know, offer what he's saying. If he doesn't, 
he will have a tough time next five years. Mm, but by and large, I, you know, he's a very clever politician. Remember, you know, we just say, you know, he doesn't do his hair as well, and he speaks in a kind of a jocular fashion. He, you know, picked up a fish and, you know, broke the wall, you know. So behind this, this lighter and, and kind of a buffoon-like persona, there is an intelligent, clever politician. He, he has been a journalist. He has been, you Me know, kind of yeah. highly educated. Mm. Uh, so uh, he's, a, he's a brilliant man. And uh, also let us look at his record as mayor of London. One of the very interesting things was that he picked up a team which could deliver. The, he, he wouldn't even mind. There was some, you know, politician of the Labour Party he took help of. So, uh, and similarly, uh, if you see his present cabinet, one of his biggest rivals, Dominique Raab, mm. he appointed as, as a, you know, kind of a foreign secretary. Mm. So he knows how to use talent within the party. Uh, he's not a kind of very strict ideological conformist, look, this, these are my enemies and I'll have to, you know, get rid of them out of the party. So I think he will able to uh, get his party together. He will not mind if some of his opponents are also in the party, as long as they deliver his program. But I was watching, uh, rather I was listening to a radio broadcast program uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, where the famous actor Hugh Grant, who is a strong Labour supporter, and he was talking about tactical voting and all of that, said that, you know, this whole uh, Boris Johnson and Conservative Party, there's a lot of Tony, uh, sort of uh, friends, and there's a lot of Etonianism, where there's a lot of uh, control, there's a lot of power politics, and, you know, you're passionate to get to the top, and they will do anything to, to, to get to the top. Do you feel that uh, when you've been observing the progress of Boris Johnson over the years, that there is that ambition, that drive, that cronyism, you know, Zach Goldsmith lost, for instance. So do you think that he's going to get another mate over or do you think that he's going to be, like you said, choosing the right kind of people in the right position? Uh, uh, again, we'll have to say, you know, we are in real politics. So, of course, he, will, he would like to have people whom he could trust. But that is not to say that he will, uh, you know, throw out everybody who do, he doesn't like. So he is. And then, you know, uh, let's also accept the fact that the, it is a Tory party. It's a conservative. It's the party of the rich and prosperous, Etonians. And, you know, so it, the party is not going to transform its character. It will remain the party of wealth creators, as they call, you know, themselves. Mm. <clears throat> so it will remain an elitist party. But now his role is because... A lot of working class people in the north of England mm. have placed their trust in this party of Boris Johnson. So he will have to uh, he will have to deliver to those people who have placed their hopes in him. Uh, and he will be quite foolish if he if he betrays that trust uh, and just reduces his party to to you know the kind of a south of England um, you know, rich people's party. So I think he has an opportunity. Uh, to transform his party, to to get away uh, that this is the party of the rich helping only the rich and and just don't caring for the uh, for the lower class or the middle class England. So I think uh, he will have to occupy the center ground. He will have to work for the working classes who have for the first time placed their trust in in, in the conservative part. This is something very extraordinary. This has happened in the politics. So I, uh, I, he has a challenging task. He has, a, he has a great opportunity now, it is uh, his, his responsibility and, and to what extent he's accountable to those people, those new voters who have placed trust in him. That's a very good point. When you, when you were listening to Mr. Johnson's speech this morning, he said uh, in his uh, utmost humility that a lot of people have put, lent their trust to me uh, when they gave me the vote. So yes, like you rightly said, it is about delivering those those promises to the part, to the people that are from the, the the working class society, as you as we call it. I'm not so sure about him being completely uh, Etonian and completely for the rich, because I do feel that you know he's had certain uh, sort of simple ways of looking at life, and he's not very flashy in some ways. 
Now, as an as an Indian, fellow Indian, um, you know, we feel very strongly uh, about uh, parties. And all along, Indians have supported Labour. We had Labour Friends of India. And now the, the shift has been to Conservatives. Do you feel that the shift to Conservatives has been the right move for Indians? And do you think it's going to help us in the long run? Well, uh, let us not forget the fact that this shift is... You know, it has happened dramatically this time, but it was always in the making. In the last decade or say, as the, as the community, you know, interestingly, the Indians are one of the most successful communities uh, in this country. Mm -hmm. And so as they were moving up the ladder, there were a lot of them, especially the, uh, the younger ones, were going away from the Labour Party uh, uh, and... Uh, moving towards, you know, with their prosperity towards the Conservative Party. So the trend has started somewhere, you know, early 2000 or so. Uh, but this election, in this election, Indians were overwhelmingly supporting the Conservatives. And the reason was because the Labour Party, a lot of people thought the Labour Party, especially the way they articulated the Indian issues, particularly in the Kashmir, uh, a lot of Indians were quite livid with the Labour Party. Because what happened in the uh, party conference that on the final morning, they passed a resolution which was virtually siding with Pakistan. So a lot of Indians saw it that what is this happening? You know, we supported this party all of our lives. And suddenly we find this party. Uh, I, and, you know, some of the things in that resolution and, and later on uh, uh, were quite, quite puzzling that we are an internationalist party and we, it is our responsibility to sort out things like Kashmir. Which so, is not correct because which, it is a bilateral issue and they had no business, right? Exactly. They, they no business. But uh, the kind of sounds and the noises they were making, uh, they seemed to pro-Pakistan and very anti-India. Mm -hmm. Again, there were constituencies like Luton, where JKLF, which is an organization, you know, working for the independence of Kashmir and openly using violence in their campaign. Uh, a lot of people, uh, they believe that this is a terrorist organization. Uh, though they will claim we are not. Uh, but JKLF uh, was sending pamphlets to the voters. In Luton? Uh, in Luton. Right. Uh, it was on their website, in the local party website and Facebook page, JKLF endorsement letter. So this is... And who is this led by? Uh, this was a kind of a, the a local president of the JKLF in, in Luton constituency. And so he wrote a letter on the, on the JKLF notepad, and then they uploaded it on the Facebook. Uh, uh, and this letter was delivered to local voters. So uh, this made also a lot of Indians very angry and that this is a party which is clearly, you know, first of all, um, uh, interfering in Indian affairs and then uh, siding with those organizations whose record has been very questionable. So uh, a lot of people were very angry with the Labour Party. Though the party president said, no, we don't want to do it, they, he wrote a letter, he gave a clarification, but there were a few buyers, by then the damage has been done. No, no, I mean, you were very right uh, in the sense that <laughs> when we were interviewing several members of uh, the political scenarios, we did ask them blatantly and quite upfront, and uh, we asked them why was Yasmin Qureshi and all of these MPs passing this uh, motion against India and calling it a... Uh, a ter you know, a human rights violator, and Jeremy Corbyn himself wrote it on Twitter. So, uh, and then when you look at the list, there's a host of all these uh, pro-Pakistan. Yeah. Interestingly, Indian. not one Indian MP of the Labour Party, unequivocally. You know, they all said that we are. You know, no, uh, we did have some actually. Uh, maybe later on, yeah, uh, you know, Sharma. Ba Barry Gardner. Um, yeah. We had uh, Bob Blackman. We had sort of. We don't have that many of, um, which is interesting, viewers. Uh, this is very important if you're watching us. Uh, if you are thinking of a political uh, career, it is very important that if you do join politics and if MPs are listening to the program as a community channel, we do find that Indians don't really stand up if things are done against them, especially in the parliament. And I've been told by many MPs that, you know, actually not that many Indian MPs of Indian origin who live in the Britain actually stand for India. So if you are, then exactly. you must stand. Yeah. Very right yeah, this point. This was the impression, yes. yes. Uh, now, coming back to uh, Kashmir, uh, before we move on to the results for today, because at the end of the day, uh, MATV viewers are people that 
feel things passionately. They, are, they care about their community. And you've been following labor quite closely as well. Do you, why do you think that this anti-Semitism, uh, anti-India, such um, dramatic situations are occurring in the Labour Party? Do you think it's a problem? Well, yes, there is a problem and there is a serious problem. And not only the Indians have pointed out towards it, a lot of even party, senior party MPs have left party. They have accused uh, party leadership, particularly Jeremy Corbyn and his deputy for being anti-Semitic. Jeremy Corbyn himself accepted that there is a problem and more has to be done. Uh, so there was a serious issue. And I was listening to a radio program while coming to the studio. Uh, a lot of Jews were saying that we have uh, we have taken a sigh of relief. So, but you know, looking at the record of Jeremy Corbyn, uh, it doesn't fit into the into the mo the mold of traditional British politics. He is he has Marxist sympathies. He, he mm -hmm. you know, in, in his early career, uh, throughout the IRA violence, he was quite he never condemned IRA. He was pro Sinn Féin. Then he has sympathies towards, you know, what is happening in the Middle East, pro Hamas, a lot of people said. Right, right. Uh, and then in the Kashmir issue, he has almost sided with, you know, uh, well, he was basically, he, he took the line that India is a serious violator of human rights in Kashmir. And so he has a long record of all these kind of anti establishment groups whether they were working in Middle East or, you know, India or, you know, kind of extremist or in Ireland. So he has a long history of supporting these, these groups. And then also there was among the traditional British voters, in fact, this somebody uh, made a very pertinent remark that the, uh, the voters in Midland and up north are very patriotic. They may be Labour supporters, but they are not prepared to buy somebody who, is, who was on the side of IRA. Mm. Is, and that was one reason. So personal record of Jeremy Corbyn did not arouse trust within the, uh, you know, ordinary British voter. Uh, you know, by and large, this is a very tolerant country. People are very decent. We came from all, we came from Africa, we came from India, Bangladesh, Syria. You know, you know, in, in London, basically, everybody is a foreigner. Yes. And nobody has the problem unless, uh, until this, this, this kind of leadership Racism came. comes into racism, Yeah, racism comes. It's, it's, it was, it, I'm not saying that there's no racism. There was always, you know, uh, there were always elements who, who had racist attitude. But by and large, it's a tolerant of yeah. society. And here was a leader who cast his lot on one side, who could not demonstrate that if it's an issue of, you know, kind of a racialism or anti-Semitism or anti-India, whatever you call it, that he is neutral and he will deal the situation as it is, as a kind of impartial judge. Mm. He was at one side and that's why people have voted against him. So uh, thank you for this interesting perspective. Rajneeti ke liye ab chota sa break to banta hai. Yes, 14 million people have voted for uh, the Conservatives. We are in a time where general elections have successfully concluded and there is a definitive answer. After the break, we'll catch up on uh, general elections 2019. Stay with us. The hottest Black Friday offer is with Leica Mobile. You get a whopping 50% off when you buy UK Plan Mega this weekend. 40 gigabytes of data, unlimited UK minutes and texts, and 100 international minutes for just £10 this weekend. It's Black Friday madness from Leica Mobile. 50% off should not be missed. Visit leicamobile.co.uk for details. Offer is valid to new customers who shop online between 28th of November and 2nd of December 2019. Leica Mobile.
Board fresh. Treat fresh. With lower altitude cabin pressure. Enjoy Air India Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Amazing feel. Amazing features. Hasten Hyde, West London ke sabse shandar hotels me se ek. With 303 air-conditioned rooms and suites, one of the largest banquet spaces in London. Meeting room for up to 1,200 people. Conferences, musical function, weddings, ya koi bhi gathering. Manpasan bhojan, shandar ayojan, aur behtareen venue. 400 gaadiyo ke parking ke saath. Heston Hyde for bookings. Call 0208-572-1818. Jay Lakhani. Sri Lakhani is a popular public speaker on Hinduism in the United Kingdom. He offers Hindu teachings to hundreds of youngsters, as well as thousands of students in schools, colleges, and universities. In a series of talks given to the postgraduate students at a dozen or so universities, he explores the depth of Hindu teachings as well as its breadth of vision. If you wish to get a glimpse of the modern, dynamic face of Hinduism, do not miss this series of talks. आप परेशान हैं और समाधान ढूंढ रहे हैं जैसे बच्चों की शादी नहीं हो रही है बच्चों के पास काम नहीं है बच्चों की एजुकेशन कैसी रहेगी क्या मेरा कभी घर बनेगा क्या मैं कभी कर्जा मुक्त हो पाऊंगा घर में हर समय अशांति बनी रहती है ऐसे बहुत सारे सवालों के साथ आप मेरे साथ बात कर सकते हैं हर बुधवार और शुक्रवार दोपहर बारह बजे से लेकर दो बजे तक एम स्काई सेवन पर Welcome back after the break. You're watching Rajneeti, I'm Darshni Joshi, and with me is Vijay Rana, who will be talking about politics and the general elections today. It's hot, it's fresh from the ovens, and there's a lot to discuss. Um, it's always important that when we talk about politics, you'll obviously want to know what is the results if you haven't seen. So the results so far that we have had made available to us, uh, obviously there might be a, a few seats here and there, but the, the results that we have is the conservative conservatives having 363 seats labor 203 uh, scottish national party has 48 liberal democrats has 11 brexit unfortunately did not have any wins and uh, the others had 23 uh, with this kind of result vijay ji uh, it's a resounding hit for uh, for labor <laughs> yes. in the sense that you know they have accepted Jeremy Corbyn has said, I am going to resign. Any views on where Labour is going to veer towards in terms of their policies, their manifesto? I think they'll have, the Labour Party has to do a lot of soul searching. What has happened is in the last few years, uh, the center ground of the Labour Party has virtually vanished. You know, the Blairites, you know, they have almost either left the party or have been thrown out of the party. Now, uh, who will be the successor of Jeremy Corbyn? And if he follows the same kind of policies as Corbyn has been following, I think Labour Party doesn't have a very bright future. Remember, this is, you know, despite Labour and Conservative in this country, uh, if you see, you know, with few exceptions, by and large, uh, the centre ground has ruled. You know, the, the, the Labour Party of Harold Wilson and the Conservative Party of Macmillan, there were hardly any difference. Similarly, the uh, Labour Party of uh, uh, Bl uh, Tony Blair and the Labour Party of John Major, hardly any difference. So uh, any party, uh, conserv sorry, Conservative Party. So any party that wants to rule this country has to rule the middle ground, has to take the middle classes into confidence. So just by having, you know, talking about the lowest of the low and the poorest of the poor, because this is not a poor country by and large. Yes, the poor needs to be looked after. A lot of, you know, government has to be accountable to them and, and work and a government should be seen to be working to uplift uh, the lot of the lowest of the low. But you cannot ignore the, the, the majority because democracy is run by majority and the majority in this country is 
middle class and upper middle class. So, uh, and the biggest problem of Labour Party that I see in the future is that middle ground has virtually vanished. So, who will be the successor? We don't know. But if we see, you know, Corbyn, if he's going, he will make sure that somebody who is from his side of ideology takes charge of the party. You know, he's, he's not going to be say, okay, I'm standing aside and, uh, and whoever wants to be the leader should be the leader. So uh, I think Labour Party is in serious difficulties now and how they come out of it, uh, you know, I see it a very, very difficult time ahead for the Labour Party. I had sort of uh, seen very strong positive vibes from the Milibans. Uh, you know, there was great hope in the young gentleman, uh, but somehow we lost them by the by. But um, like you very correctly mentioned, you know, there's a very strong view and the public opinion has been that there's a hard left socialism uh, in Jeremy Corbyn's approach. Even Nigel Farage on Twitter goes on to say, uh, that he's very hard left and there's a lot of uh, sort of strange nationalistic points of view. Uh, Labour is destroyed though. Um, Corbyn, he won a seat in Islington, but Labour is destroyed quite so, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why do you think that after so many years, uh, the Conservatives are constantly sort of winning and labor who've been rather popular and you have that what is it the red carpet or the red blanket the red stretch why is it crumbling uh, that uh, you know let us analyze the labor party one is the kind of hardcore left with who have spent all their lives you know working for a certain leftist agenda so these people are going to stay they're not going to leave uh, but then there was a kind of sub a group of young idealistic students who believe in you know kind of a uh, for the uplift of the poor who believe in you know kind of environmentalism that we should let's do something you know kind of a very idealistic young university students yes a lot of uh, young people uh, we felt when we were we were sort of following the exit poll last night at 10 o'clock when it was sort of uh, released uh, young people who were just their first election 18 had joined the labor yeah. support group yeah. And these people will be really, really disappointed. Yes, that will, this, this, here's where my question to you is, what happens to those disillusioned youngsters? Where do you think they will veer towards? Well, it's, it's, it's very difficult to say because, you know, uh, but what I can see is that their interest in politics was just beginning. They were the beginners and, the, and they were the newcomers to the politics. So a lot of people, when they find their careers, will you know will leave politics and settle in, in their own little corners in their own life. But there will be a lot of frustration that we came with so much of idealism, and we supported this gentleman who refused to come out of his closet, mm. who refused to address the uh, the larger issues of the of the nation because he was so ideologically, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, tied with the ideology. Look, ideology is a very interesting thing. You know, ideology, uh, it changes your mind. Ideology is a prison. You are committed to a certain set of values and ideas. And when those values are ideas, uh, and they all get old. So there comes a time when you have to leave them and you have to transform them. But if you're ideologically chained, then you don't see that line when... It, 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 so the British politics is going to, uh, through an age of transition and transformation. Transformation, yeah. Trans and you can't get on just just stick or chain with an ideology, which was the ideology of the 60s or 70s. So obviously, uh, here's my question to you. When you mentioned 60s and 70s, that's when it sort of struck me. Uh, when did you come to this country? Around that, that, that same period? Well, I came to this country in November 1982. Right. And that was again a very, very changing times. The the old socialist ideology was crumbling. Free market was coming. Thatcher Thatcher has just won 1978. She won 83. When I came within months, there was this a 1983 election, and Thatcherism was, you know, it very was, strong. It was very strong, thriving. And for the first time, I thought that, you know, uh, because I was born and brought up in India, and I was born with Mrs. Gandhi's socialist rhetoric. And when I heard Margaret Thatcher saying that socialism makes uh, people poor, you know, rich people poorer and poor poorer, 
I thought this lady is mad. Mm. Because if you don't work for the poor, who will you work for? So uh, th that's where my question, don't lose your chain of thoughts here because it's very important that you give us your perspective and people who are listening to us, they, they need to sort of also ask themselves this question. And then, you know, a lot of people of the older generation will have this question. Why do you think the Indian diaspora settled in the UK align themselves to, to the, the Labour Party? You mentioned in, in the initial part of the program, it was because of the Kashmir issue. Of course, that and what happened at the 15th of August outside the Indian High Commission. But other than that, it, from the 60s, 70s, going up to when you came to the 80s and stuff, why was there an alignment towards labor? Well, this is a very interesting question, and there are very strong historical connections. In fact, I met a gentleman called Lord Fanner Brockway. Uh, he was the great, uh, you know, kind of ideologue of the Labour Party during the 1930s. And he was the man who put on uh, the Gandhi topi in the British Parliament in 1931 when Gandhi launched his salt satyagraha, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Shimla which was the summer capital of the British government in those days, you cannot walk with, with Khadi Topi or the Gandhian Topi in, in India. You could be arrested for wearing that cap. So this gentleman, Fanner Brockway, stood in the British, uh, British House of Commons and put on the topi. the topi and challenged Churchill that, will you arrest me for the crime of wearing this Khadi Topi with Mahatma Gandhi and you know, Nehru and all the congressmen there. So Congress party has uh, historical connections during the freedom movement, they were seen as the friend of Congress party, the Labour Party leaders here. Michael Foote was a great supporter of, of, of you know. But India. unfortunately, he yeah. didn't get, he yeah. didn't get anywhere he did, with Thatcher. Yeah. He, he didn't get anywhere. He lost the 1983 election. Mm. So the, uh, the, uh, the Stafford Cripps mm. and the Labour Party gave independence, uh, Clement Attlee's government, which gave independence to India. So Labour Party was seen very friendly to India. That, there was a long record of friendliness between Labour and the in Indian National Congress. So that was one thing. Secondly, when uh, a lot of people came to this country during the 60s, uh, you know, early 60s, they were working class people. They came from the villages of Punjab and Gujarat, maybe some bang from Bengal. They went into lower level jobs in the factories, South Hall rubber factory. There's a huge history of yeah. behind it. There was, you know, kind of this oats factory called a Dalia factory used to be. So anybody who was coming uh, to, uh, to this country was getting jobs in these the low jobs, very dirty jobs in these factories. And they all used to become members of the Labour Party because that's where they saw some sort of protection. So there's a long history of our forefathers were Labour members and they blindly supported Labour Party. So it's so heartbreaking, you know, when I'm listening to this and obviously, you know, there is such a uh, deep passion. So in a way, this must be an eye opener for the Labour government to understand that, you know what, if we wanted to come back into power, we should have had some empathy towards people that have emigrated to this country and made such a substantial contribution, uh, such amazing history, and to not have that respect that India, sort of Indians who have made contribution needed is heartbreaking. And that's why there's been a complete conservative shift from what you're saying. And it kind of makes sense to some extent. Now, um, there is this question about um, one, one always has to come back to issues that sort of concern you. So now the free trade uh, deal with the European Union, you know, the Labour had, uh, party had a strong view on that. The Conservatives are saying we will try and achieve it within this year. Do you think it's possible? Well, there will be long and protected uh, discussions. You know, the Europe, everybody will try to guard their patch. We have had some sort of deal which, you know, uh, Boris Johnson says this is the idealist deal. There, there are issues about the, you know, this border in the sea yes. in Northern, Northern Ireland. Ireland yeah. so, uh, and so it's not going to be easy, but I think now that reality has set in, even European leadership knows where Britain stands. Britain has made its position very clear. So I think they will not sell far, both, neither Europe, no, you know, because if it's, if it's too long, it's too protected, it's too bitter, then both parties are going to, remember, Britain is still a big power, you know, in, in, in Europe, you know, it's a successful economy, it's one of the most powerful economy after Germany in, in, in Europe. So Britain has a role, and how that role uh, is 
played out in Perfect, future. Yeah. Um, it will be, if it is amicable, if it is done with decency and, and, and some respect to both parties, it's in the interest of both Europe as well as Yes, I mean, there is Britain. this tweet that you're talking about as well in terms of the support that uh, other governments from the world are giving. Uh, Mr. Donald Trump is quite sort of passionate in terms of supporting Boris Johnson and he's talking about the continued support for the, 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 the trade deal for with the European Union that he's going to give. So hopefully that will come through. He has used the word massive, massive advantage <laughs> yeah, Britain will yeah. have. So he, he's, he's saying, come on, you know, my shop is open for you. Yeah, trade, business, trade, business, trade. business, business. So that's a positive. Also, we should not forget the Prime Minister Narendra Modi has uh, congratulated uh, you know, Boris Johnson this morning mm. and he has expressed hope that uh, the, of a fruitful relationship between the two countries. So India is also looking for opportunities and jo Boris Johnson had made some sort of headway. You know, uh, let's remember when um, uh, um, Prime Minister May became Prime Minister, the first trade mission she took to India. And there she was, in a, she was not prepared to concede any ground and she wanted all the benefits from India, mm -hmm. which India slightly refused. What Boris Johnson did was a very good semantics. He showed, he gave Indian students coming to study in this country two years uh, post-study work visa. And that has created a lot of kind of a good in, in India and positive vibes. So if it is a give and take, I'm sure India-British trade relations will flourish in the future. So in terms of relationships, uh, obviously this is good to hear that there is some positivity that Boris Johnson, our, our new prime minister, has uh, already brought to uh, the Indian subcontinent. Uh, when it comes to his own country, uh, there's a lot of infighting going on, right? Uh, Nicola Sturgeon, there's been interesting, her shooting with happiness and charging against uh, her, her sort of uh, opposition candidate and there is this talk about the second referendum. How do you think Boris is going to deal with this constant? It's like you know the Kashmir issue. Like we, we want to s s set up a separate country. How does how how do you think he's going to squash that out? Well, coming to Scotland, I'm really happy for Ruth Davison, the the Conservative Party leader. Do you remember she made a statement that if Nicola Sturgeon gets more than fifty seats, <laughs> I will swim naked <laughs> in the Loch Ness. Yes. <laughs> So that embarrassment she has been saved. Yes. Uh, SNP has got only 48. So right. had they got two more seats, Ruth Davidson would have to do something really extraordinary. In the Loch Ness, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> so it's good for her. Mm. But 48 seat is a very, very strong uh, position to be in. And she has clearly said that she will be trying for next referendum about Scottish freedom. So there are serious, you know, this is a serious concern, concern uh, because uh, if there's another, you know, referendum, we don't know which way, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Be, though, uh, personally, I feel it would be quite foolish for Scotland to go to leave the United Kingdom. Yeah, but, and Boris is so yeah. passionate about what you had mentioned earlier as well, about one nation, one government, right? Mm, exactly. There's, yeah. there's no point about them going about this, but you're, like you said, you know, uh, it is a challenge. We're looking at some figures and results. There's been massive upheavals in London. Uh, a few casualties, some victories. So in terms of our local MPs and the ones that make a difference to our Indian community, our Pakistani community, our Bangladeshi and the, and the rest of the audiences that watch us regularly, Bob Blackman has won Harrow East. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was the only, uh, uh, you know, I said he was the only Indian in the British Parliament who spoke unequivocally in favor of India on mm -hmm. Kashmir. He was yeah. right from the beginning. He was very clear. He was pro India. He was pro, you know, Indian side of the Kashmir. There's no other British MP was so clear and unequivocal as yes. he was. Yeah. Um, then we have Felicity Buchan, who again won uh, the Kensington seat for Conservatives. Mm -hmm. That was an amazing success. Like you mentioned, Dominic Grass, uh, Nikki Aitken for um, sort of um, the Westminster Council. Uh, you mentioned something about Munira Wilson. That's an interesting story, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You said was was she the only liberal Democrat that sort of uh, made it with a resounding thirty six thousand one hundred sixty six votes in the in the in the in the sort of uh, the UK? Uh, I think uh, you know. It's, I'm not sure what happened actually. You know, had she won, uh, I didn't uh, okay. look at her constituency more carefully. 
we will we'll yeah. get into that. I also yeah. want to talk to you about uh, Zach Goldsmith. Munir Wilson was in in Twickenham, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah, Twickenham. Yeah. yeah. She, she has she has retained the seat. It was. Uh, yeah, I remember it now because this was uh, the the Twickenham has always been a Lib Dem, you know, mm. seat. So as a safe, you know, the only London constituency that has voted for in the last four or five elections uh, for for Lib Dem. So and a lady, uh, yeah. um, 220, 220 women mm. MPs. So that's mm. a it's a record yeah. that uh, Prime mm. Minister Boris Johnson has set, um, which is very good, you know. Uh, and thanks to you know for that, I'll give credit to. Uh, uh, Tony Blair, because do you remember suddenly there were more than 100 MPs in the Labour Party and they were called the Blair Babes. And, <laughs> Blair Babes, you know, yeah. The yeah. lovely photograph, you know, surrounded by all these beautiful, you know, ladies, Tony Blair, a young, dashing Prime Minister. Yes. So, so that was a kind of a uh, time uh, during the mid 90s when the British politics took a decisive turn and the parliament, which was a male preserve, suddenly, you know, Sorry, became. Man. And in fact, India. Has been debating this you know, women representation parliament for many for more than two decades now. Mm. India has something to learn, and no law was passed. Just parties decided that let us give some safe constituencies to women candidates. Uh, and they were, in fact, in my own constituency, there was all women field. Mm. All the three major parties have women candidates. Uh, you know, uh, Brentford and Elizabeth. Mm. Uh, Is it Sheena Shah? Yeah, Sina, Sina Shah was conservative candidate. Mm. Uh, Helen Cross was liberal Democrat, and Ruth, mm. uh, you know, Cadbury mm. was one who, who has retained the seat. Is, is from the Labour Party, uh, which is uh, interesting. I was just looking at again uh, a lot of women who sort of made a mark. Anwara Ali, yeah. she's done really well. Mm. Uh, she didn't win. Yeah, yeah but mm. for a first timer, mm. she 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 reached a good sixteen, mm. eighteen thousand majority. And she she done a very good campaign, going to you know. All these temples and you know mm. going to all these mm. places. You know. um, again, Luciana Berger, although she lost, mm. um, she she did well uh, in Finchley and Golders Green. Um, Joe Swinson, <laughs> that must be heart heartbreaking. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's tragic, really, because you know the the problem she has. She's perhaps the uh, right heart and all the right issues, making all the right noises, but somehow she couldn't connect with the British. Uh, audience and this part her party is totally squeezed you know all the 11 uh, you know um, she's lost her own she's, seat. she's just lost her own seat which is in in Scotland mm -hmm. uh, so I think you know uh, what has been seen the Scottish leaders press don't do very well in the mainstream British politics to, you know Brown was again a casualty mm -hmm. couldn't win the election mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's tough luck she she ran a good campaign she was making right noises. She was very sensible, coming, you know, kind of trying to occupy the middle ground. But this is the first past post election system, and, and they have been squeezed between these two giants of British parties, Labour Party and Conservative Party. So that's why they, these, they haven't done very well. So liberal, liberal Democrats have struggled, but like we talked earlier in the show, I mean, as we come to the end of the show almost, um, I, I, I'm wondering about Dennis Shiver losing his seat. Um, mm after 49 years to a young gentleman mm -hmm. called Mark Fletcher. Mm -hmm. um, Conservative uh, has toppled mm -hmm. uh, seats in Wolverhampton, West Bromwich, mm -hmm. uh, a lot mm -hmm. of the Midlands and, and Wales. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned something uh, about um, the, the working classes and stuff, but it can't be just that. It mm -hmm. must be more, right? Dennis Skinner, I really, you know, I'm slightly surprised and, and it's a bit sad. He's kind of an old fatherly figure mm. and always outspoken. Michael Kessel time, time, yeah. Yeah, always, yeah, much more, and not as restrained as Michael, mm. and not as intelligent as Michael at the time. But then he was, he has a personality, he has a figure. And I remember when, you know, at the opening of Parliament, he mm. has a very curious role when the Queen's representative uh, comes to, uh, uh, to knock at the door of House of Commons that Queen wants them to be in their presence, he will always snub that guy, the Queen's representative, to assert the uh, the supremacy of the House of Commons, people's democracy. So that was his role, always snub the Queen's, you know. Yes, column. and Jeremy Corbyn did that. And unfortunately, yeah. as we wrap up the program, we have to say that kind of technique didn't work. Uh, when he went to the reception round, he was very sort of, um, welcoming to, the, to to Mr. Trump and the rest of the people. 
also to Modi, he, he went a very reluctant day. He was very happy. You know. So, general elections 2019, today's been the first day. You've been watching Rajneeti with me, Darshini Joshi. Uh, we're doing another program of Rajneeti covering that uh, tomorrow as well. Uh, we're going to like to say thank you to Vijay thank Rana you. Ji for coming in thank and you. discussing all the wonderful topics and all the different seats and all the ups and downs of the Labour, the Conservative, the Brexit, the Liberal Democrats, the main players of the market. But thank you. If you've been watching and if you have questions, do email us, do write to us via Facebook. We always have a live chat. Shunamashkar from Rajneeti. We're saying thank you and stay always tuned to METV.